If you have your Bibles, uh, there are some in the pews. If you don't, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. There's some under the seats. If you've got a smartphone, tablet, uh, whatever you've got to look up in the Bible. We're going to be in the book of Zephaniah. Okay, so I understand that might take you a moment to find, right? Old Testament, minor prophet. There's only a few pages of Zephaniah. If you find Haggai, go back a page. There you go, right? On, on the right side of Psalms and Proverbs, on the left side of Malachi, all right? So Zephaniah 3 is where we're going to be hanging out for the day. You will see some of the scripture up on the screen as well um, if you want to follow along today. So we are in the, the third week of Advent, right? One, two, three, yeah, third week of Advent. I think that's the right math by my count. If not, well, I'm not a math major, okay? <laughs> in Advent, Advent is a season in which Christians uh, originally began in looking back looking back to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus Christ. But it's also, as we've been talking about, the looking forward to that second advent, that second coming of Jesus Christ. And so simultaneously, as, as Christ followers, we're, we're looking backwards as well as looking forwards in this season of advent, acknowledging that our, our lives are, are playing out in, in what the really brilliant theologians I studied under in in seminary would say, this in-between space. They called it the already but the not yet, right? Which is always confusing, especially when you get into Greek. One of the difficulties in the Greek language is it has tense terms, which means, you know, past, present, and future in English. Well, they got some other tenses in Greek, and and there's words that mean this has already happened, but it's not yet happened. Uh, Wrap your mind around that for a little while, right? Uh, But that is... That is what it is we celebrate because we got the book of Revelation. We see how it ends. So it's the already but not yet, right? So in the first week of Advent, we talked about hope. We talked about how our hope is built not on probabilities, but it's built on promises, the, the promises of God. Our, our hope finds its roots in God's promises, the ones that he has made and the ones that he has fulfilled in the work and person of Jesus Christ. And so God is the the source of our hope, and not only is he that, but he's the sustainer of our hope. And then beyond that, we saw then last week that God comes into our lives then, and then is the refiner of our lives. He, He shows his love for us through the refinement process. With the coming of Jesus Christ into our world and into our lives, God, God is at work. And we saw, and, and, and the thing I repeated multiple times is that God is therefore at work in the mess, right? My life has a little bit of mess in it. How about yours, right? And, 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 and of course, we rejoiced in the fact last week that God is at work in the middle of that mess, and as much as we really long for, for, for a life of ease, a life of comfort, a life where everything goes all smoothy, honky-dory, right? Anybody know that term? Yeah, honky-dory. We don't use that much anymore, but it's all honky-dory. It's all good, right? As much as we want this smooth sailing life, as much as we want a life that it's 75 and never rains, and the sun is out every day, Right? A life of ease, comfort, no difficulty. As much as we really want that, it's really in the mess of life where we see God at work the most. And it's also in the mess of life where we find ourselves most desperately needing God. Most desperately needing to be in that right relationship with God. And so it's through that refinement process in the middle of that mess of our lives where we draw near to God, where we learn to rely upon God, where we learn to trust God. Now, as we saw last week, sometimes that refinement, it stings a little bit, right? Discipline. Discipline stings, right? That refining love of God has, uh, at times, a, a little bit of pain that comes with it. But that is part of the process of when you heat up the gold, right? I, I used this example last week. When, when they find the gold on Gold Rush on TV and they got to heat that up so all the dross, all the, all the non-gold stuff, the impurities can be gotten rid of. But in that crucible, it takes an awful lot of heat. I don't know if you've ever been near a forge where they melt down metals. Wow, they get hot. And so when you're in the middle of that, you feel that heat, you feel that pressure, that discomfort 
that refinement, that disciplining of God. But it's the way that God is showing us he loves us. As I said last week, I say this to my son at times, I I love you too much to leave you alone and let you be this way. So we're going to make some changes, right? And God does that to us. That's what we talked about last week. And then within that, we continue to live in this space, this, this space of the here and in between, this place where, where we do, if we're honest, live with some anxiety. We do live with some fear. We, we live with worry. We live with disease. We live with hurt. We live with loss. But yet knowing that God is coming to take all of that away. And so we put our hope in that God, knowing that eventually those things will vanish forever. And to that end, and to do that, uh, today, as I said, we're going to look at Zephaniah 3, and hopefully now I've talked long enough, you've actually found that book in your Bible. So it's a hard book to find, even for pastors. This is Zephaniah 3. Um, we're going to be in Zephaniah 3, and I'm going to start in verse 9. We'll work our way out to verse 20. So we're going to cover a bit of ground. I'm going to read this for you if you want to follow along. And after I read it, then we're going to walk our way through and do some talking about it. But, but sometimes it's just good. Sometimes it's actually great just to read a chunk of Scripture aloud, to hear the Word of God proclaimed. And so I'm going to read this. I'm going to use the NIV version today, which is a little bit different than what I normally do, but I like this version the way it has a a few little twists in it. Um, I like the way they worded it. So I'm going to read that, but follow along if you would. It says, then I will purify the lips of the people and all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings on that day. Jerusalem will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me. This is God speaking because I will remove From you, your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek and the humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say (coughs) to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take a great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and a reproach for you. And this this is a great part. Listen to these eyes. These are the eyes of God. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. And at that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the people of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word. Amen. So what we see, see going on here, what we see happening here in this chapter of Zephaniah is, is we really see that the, the first coming of Jesus Christ, because this predates him, this first coming of, of Jesus Christ has, has brought about what will eventually be the second advent of Jesus Christ, the, what will consummate everything forever, what we see in the book of Revelation, that, that Christ has brought all of these things spoken of here to be. And yet within that, the refining love of God, the the purifying love of God, that that burning off as we go through that process, that that chiseling away, so to speak, as God is making us, we were already made in his masterpiece, but he's still chiseling away uh, the excess that's on some of us, right? And as we see that heading towards the second coming of Christ, within that, then eventually we will see all of these things that he just spoke about that will come fully into being. Now, there's two things in particular that I, I, I want you to think about. I want you to consider as we enter into what we call the home stretch of Advent, so to speak. Here, we're, we're heading towards the end of this season. Has everybody got all their Christmas presents bought yet? Has anybody like me not yet started? 
Men, raise your hands. Come on, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's the reason malls are open on Christmas Eve day is men, right? But, but here's the first reason I want you to see here. The promises we see here in Zephaniah 3 concerning the coming of Jesus and then eventually the ultimate return of Jesus because it kind of spans both. The first thing we see there is that discord and conflict are going to be vanishing, right? Can you imagine a world where there's no disunity, where there's no discord, where, where people are fully living in harmony? And you see starting in verse 9 there, this, this stunning promise that God gives, this, this restoration of unity that he is speaking about, that we will be experiencing a world that he has put back together, that he has mended and melded together. A world in which discord and disunity is gone. Now, as we think about it, one of the drawbacks, there's, there's some great positives, but one of the drawbacks in modern communication is, is that things get communicated to us so quickly, and, and sometimes things that are intentionally communicated with a way in which a way to cause us to be outraged, right? To cause us to be angry, to cause us uh, to be frustrated. The, the, the things come at us intentionally to create discord, and then that begins to fester in our own hearts. And it begins to cause divisions with people around us, right? It's, it's this day and age we live in. We see it. We've got the 24-7 news cycle, right? When I was growing up, there weren't TV stations, and same with many of you, that, that had news all day long. And when you have to tell the news all day long, there reaches a point where there isn't new news, so you either recycle or you start to almost make up the news, right? And, and that seems to have occurred some, right? I don't think I'm the only one who's observed that. It's, it, it happens. And so it becomes sensationalistic. It becomes overtly intentional to raise our ire, to make us outraged, right? And then you got things like Facebook where, you know, you got stuff that gets shared and whether or not it's true or not doesn't really matter to the person sharing necessarily. And so things come through Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever it is you use, all the social media are susceptible to it. And, and, and after just a few minutes, if you're not careful, all of a sudden you've got this ability to just be raging and outraged and angry. There's plenty of fuel there to fuel you for quite a while, right? Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. It doesn't even matter. We're just furious now because we read this thing on the internet. And so this idea of discord, I mean, we just saw this in our last election cycle. We're not far removed from it. This idea of discord exists where caricatures of people, where false arguments are presented, sometimes outright lies are spread all throughout our society, making a mess of things, dividing people against people intentionally, using people against people for political gain to fuel outrage, Right? A dangerous thing because if you don't think with your mind then you begin to think with your emotions and then you actually become a puppet for somebody else who's controlling you and so we have to be careful and that's what this passage is, is talking about it's talking about this coming of the Messiah who's going to bring a time where all of that is gone when the Messiah comes when he fulfills these promises of God, he's going to do away with all of that. The discord, the disunity, the division, the frustration, the infighting, the divisiveness at the return of Jesus is done away with. So here in Zephaniah 3, we get this picture of unity where we've been brought back together. And here's what happens then when when that discord and that conflict vanish. There's a couple of things it says in the text. In that process, the first thing we see is that our lips become purified, right? Think about conflict for a minute. How much of conflict in your life is birthed out of things that you said? Right? A lot of it. 
How many of you remember, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, right? Lie, 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 lie. That's not true. Frankly, I, I would rather have a broken bone than some of the words I've experienced in my life. I don't know about you. Bones will mend. Bones will heal. Some of those verbal wounds, we carry them for life, don't we? A, a truer version of that would actually sound more like sticks and stones may break my bones, but words could crush my soul, Right? I mean, the Bible is very clear that words hold the power of life and death. They can build up and encourage, or they can functionally destroy and devastate. Jesus would say it this way, for out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. And since we believe as Christians that our hearts are fundamentally broken, it shouldn't surprise us that Discord occurs because our hearts are broken. But then, Jesus steps in. But then, Jesus begins to heal our heart, right? Then Jesus begins to change our lips. But, unfortunately, it doesn't quite change as quickly as we would like it to, right? Everyone who had a verbal fight with somebody this week, say amen. Oh, you're going to leave me hanging, just me? <laughs> Come on now, right? That's all right. I'll carry the burden for all of you. <sighs> the words matter. And we see here that through Jesus coming into the world then, both at the beginning of Advent and the second coming of Advent, that our hearts are being purified, Right? that our, our lips are beginning to be changed. The Apostle Paul writes about it this way in Ephesians 4.29. Paul says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. The key here being the, the idea of this using our words to build people up, using our words to give people life. That is what happens when souls and hearts are transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet, we live in that season of not fully being there yet, right? But the good news, if we have faith, is that if we follow Jesus, we can look back in our lives. We may not be perfect today, but we can see we are getting better, right? Right? We can see growth. We can see process. And that's part of that living in the already, but not yet, I spoke of earlier. Christ has brought in his coming, in his life, and in his death, and in his resurrection, he has started to erode from underneath discord at its very foundation. He's beginning to restore all things. The beginning of the Bible started with perfection, right? The end of the Bible will end with perfection. Unfortunately, we live in that in-between. Now from there, God goes on to say through Zephaniah, not only will he be working on our lips and purifying us that way, but then the next step is that shame, shame is going to be vanquished. Shame is going to be done away with. Shame is going to be put behind us. What does shame have to do with discord, right? What does shame have to do with conflict? I mean, shame sounds kind of personal, doesn't it? Well, if we're honest about it, if we're honest about shame, uh, and we're in church, so we should probably be honest this morning, right? I mean, some of you were like, when you came in, well... We put on our good clothes, we put on our good smiles, everything is going to look great while we're at church, even though you had an argument on the drive here, right? I've been there. Having the argument, driving to church, you get out of the car, hey, everything's good. Get back in the car, Arr. like bipolar Christian. You're up, you're down. 
But in reality, shame birthed in a broken heart drives all kinds of of strife. It drives all kinds of discord. If you have a, a perpetual sin in your life, and what I mean by that is not one that you're constantly stumbling with, but it's one of those ones that you continue to occasionally stumble over, right? I mean, does anybody else have this happen in their life? You just kind of, there's this thing in your life, there's this thing in my life, and it's like, oh yeah, I'm making progress. And all of a sudden, ugh, you stumble over that stupid old sin again, right? Oh, I did it again. Oh man, I can't believe I did it again. I thought I was past that. I thought I'd grown beyond that. I thought I was better than that, but stupid thing tripped me again. Anybody have like a table in your living room you smash your shin on when you walk by occasionally and you're like, I thought I was done hitting my shin on that thing. I should move it. I mean, you don't hit it, you don't hit it most of the time, but when you hit it, you know it, right? It makes a mark. Well, even as Christians, we have sin in our lives that's like that. We, we're trying to get beyond it. We don't want to hit it again, but bam, there it is again. Out of the blue. Where did that come from? I thought I was past it. And so all of a sudden we get frustrated with ourselves when something like that happens, right? We get angry with ourselves. We can't believe I fell for that again. Oh, man. I made these promises. I broke these promises. I swore with tears, Lord, I will never do it again. Only like six weeks later, there I did it again. It's this thing. It's, it's this monster, right, that we're fighting and so what happens then when you become frustrated with yourself, when you're angry with yourself, when you, when you begin to feel that shame and that guilt, what happens then? Well, in my experience, shame and guilt have a tendency to, to leach out sideways, to strike out unexpectedly at those who are around you, right? When you have a, a secret sin or when you have the sin that you just keep having pop back into your life, you know this is true. And when you give over to those sins, you, you, you start to begin, for whatever reason, to be sensitive to those things around you. Right? Like, like if that's your sin, and then you see somebody else doing it, all of a sudden you're like, hey! I see you doing that, right? Like, like uh, I won't even go there. We'll leave it. But if we, if we have that sin, we all of a sudden will lash out randomly. Even though we're not necessarily ready to admit ourselves, we're mired down once again with that very same problem. And so your heart becomes disjointed. You start to blame those around you. You start to see their faults. Remember uh, scripture, get the log out of your eye before you worry about the splinter or the fleck in their eye. That's kind of where we're at. But we don't see that log, do we? I got an old two by four in my eye and I see your toothpick. And I'm going to criticize you for that toothpick. Yet, here stands that big old two by four. So when shame is removed and that self hate is removed, it begins to it begins to reconcile and it begins to stop you from destroying your relationships. Christ has brought us and bought for us with his blood freedom. But the problem is we live in that in-between space. We want that freedom desperately. Yet, we live in such a way where we don't share that freedom. We want the grace of God, but we don't share the grace of God. That's what happens when we live in a cycle of shame. But the good news of Jesus Christ is he has bought us by his blood our freedom. So the hope is then that we are getting better at that along the way, that he is moving us, he is sanctifying us, that Christ is changing us. Not as fast as we would like, but it's happening. I had this conversation just the other day with my son. We were talking about something that's a, a slow process in life. And the subject didn't matter, but I, I said, buddy, when was the last time you noticed you were growing? When did you notice your feet got bigger or you got taller? 
I haven't, Dad. But are you taller? Yeah. Right? Spiritually, we grow in much the same way. We don't just make these huge jumps most of the time. They do happen. But most of the time, it's a steady onward plodding of faith. That sounds real exciting, right? Let's plod to spiritual growth. How many of you are with me? But that's largely how it works. And the good news in that is then, if you look back, look back to where you were. Look back to where that person in your life you were about to criticize was and see where they now are. He's changing us. And the, the next thing it says in that passage, it says here that arrogant boasters, right? I love that. Arrogant boasters are going to be removed. You see, the reason I love that is when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, it is an act of humility. To become a Christian means that I finally have to say, I can't fix what's broken with me. I can't fix what's wrong in me. I'm finally so exhausted, Lord. Here, you take it. I've messed it up as bad as I can. And I can't fix it. I can't do it on my own, Lord. Right? I've broken it and I can't fix it. To surrender your life to Christ is an act of humility. It's humbling to surrender yourself. To acknowledge, I can't do it. Only you can, Lord. If you're still a little bit confused about the refining work of God and how Christians might rejoice in difficult times, it is in those difficult times where we're reminded of our deepest need. Sometimes we say this, and you've heard this, I'm sure, sometimes we've got to get to the bottom of the well before we realize how far down we've gone, right? Sometimes we've got to fall all the way. Sometimes God in his refining grace lets us crash in order to get our attention. We sometimes do this as parents, don't we? Sometimes we watch our children knowing, well, that's probably not going to end well, but I'd rather he learn that lesson than the much more painful one down the road. And sometimes the refinement of God, he allows us in our sin to do stupid things. But then, in the middle of that mess, where the bottom of the well, where all we could do is look up. And when all you can do is look up, what do you see? You see the only one who can rescue you. There's only one. We can't do it on our own. And here God says that the arrogant boasters are going to be removed. Keep in mind that all that you are, all that you have been given, has been given to you by God. If you're a good businessman, God gave that to you. If you're good at sports, God gave that to you. If you're really smart, God gave that to you. You got a great family, God gave that to you. If you were born in America, God gave that to you. You could have been born in Aleppo, Syria. You could have been born in the slums in Brazil. Yet you were privileged to be born here. All that we have is a glorious and good gift of God. Praise his name, right? Praise his name. Whatever good gifts that you have been given, praise the name of God. Don't fail to acknowledge him. He is the author of all that we are. When all is said and done, remember back to this text. It's the lowly and the meek, God says, who will remain. The humble, not the proud. Pride was the sin of the devil. Pride is what got Satan kicked out of heaven. Pride is a dangerous thing. And this is what Advent is actually all about. 
we look back. We were broken. We were lost. And then we look at the present. We're redeemed. We're not perfect yet, but we're improving. And then we look towards the future, that in Christ someday, we will be perfected. That's what the whole season of Advent is about. But that's not the only thing that happens here. We see not only do the discord and conflict vanish, but it continues on in this passage. And this is where it gets really good, folks. We see in this passage that joy becomes our default mode of living. I want more joy. Who else wants more joy? I want more joy. And and we see in this passage, God tells us that joy becomes our default mode 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 of living. Back to verse 14. Sing, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. This is the people of God. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, daughter Jerusalem. I mean, I love that language. Daughter. Familial language. We are part of God's family. And he says, the Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear, O Zion. Never again will you fear harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And then we get to those I statements I mentioned, mentioned earlier. I, the God of all creation, will remove from you all who mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals. I'm going to remove those who repressed you, who oppressed you. I'm going to rescue the lame. I'm going to gather the exiles. I'm going to gather and bring you in says the Lord of all hosts. I'm going to restore your fortunes before their very eyes, says the Lord. Here God is pronouncing blessing upon us. Sing, shout, rejoice, be glad with all of your heart. The Lord is saying. And if we stop there for just a little second... There is something amazing that happens when we sing, right? When we come together as the body of Christ, when we sing together, singing has an effect on us as human beings. Music has an effect on us. You ever been walking through maybe the mall and all of a sudden you'll hear a choir singing down the hallway, right? Or maybe... You just happen to walk in somewhere at the right time and somebody's singing and you get goosebumps. You ever experienced goosebumps from somebody singing? Music has power. Music has an effect on us. And the Bible commands us to sing and rejoice and to shout and be glad. It doesn't say sing on key. It's nice if you do, but not all of us can. It doesn't just say sing when you're having a good day. No, shout and rejoice and be glad even on your bad days. Because God has put this in your heart. And when we sing, for whatever reason, God has ordained it, that that our heart and our head connect in a way that few other things in the world do. One of the most powerful ways you can learn something is to sing it. You want to learn all the books of the Bible in order? You can sit down and study those and try to memorize Okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Uh, what goes next? Oh, 1 Corinthians. Then what? Oh, 2 Corinthians, right? That's a lot of work to memorize it that way. You could do it. But there's a song that you can sing that kids sing. And they'll memorize the whole Bible in order by singing the song. Singing stirs our affections. Maybe you have a, a particular hymn that stands out for you, Right? 
I love Come Thou Fount. Come Thou Fount is a goose pimple song for me, whether I'm listening or whether I'm singing. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Right? Just saying that. I can feel my scalp tingle. I don't even have to be singing it, just thinking those words. And I think singing and how we approach singing and rejoicing and and, and enjoying God is a, a testimony about how free we are in Christ. I mean, think about it. What limits are rejoicing and shouting and singing and clapping and and fully worshiping in a song? What limits us is our worry about the person sitting in front of us and what they're going to think, right? We're a little bit nervous that the guy sitting in front of us, I mean, what's he going to think? Is he going to think somebody's like slaughtering a seal behind him? What is that sound? What's going on back there, right? No, we're here to worship. If you can't sing well, sing loud. It's okay. This is a safe place, safe house. It is okay to express ourselves in worship. You can raise your hand for something other than swatting at a fly. That's okay. It's not going to make you a freak. It's not going to make you weird. Do wear deodorant if you're going to do it. But you can raise your hands. You can lift your voice. You can rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice, Scripture says, right? And if you think about it, what stops us from doing this is fear. Self-motivated personal fear. We're too proud to be embarrassed. So sometimes we don't sing. Sometimes we don't lift our hands when God is moving in our hearts. Sometimes we don't feel free to worship, even though we should be fully free. The Bible here commands it. Sing. Rejoice. Shout. Clap your hands. Make a joyful noise. Rejoice and be glad in me, says the Lord. Our bodies are to be involved in the act of worship. Now, you don't have to go flailing and dancing, I mean, but it's okay to do the Scandinavian wiggle, you know? Yeah? You that little shoulder bob. That's a lot for a Swede, I get that. That, that toe can get tapping, and your head can nod a little bit. Those are all appropriate worship gestures, Okay? And then what is the motivation behind all of that? What is the how behind the why? Behind the sing and shout and rejoice and make, make noise gladly with our hearts. What's behind that? Well, I'm glad you answered, Pastor. Glad you asked. Church. In verse 15. Why do we sing? Why do we shout? Why do we clap? Why do we rejoice with all of our hearts? Because according to verse 15, our punishment has been removed. That is so awesome. Right? Our punishment has been removed. We are lawbreakers. We have rebelled against the holy and perfect God and creator of all the universe. And it says all, capital letters, A-L-L, L, have been removed. Not because of you but because of Christ. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is what God has done, folks. This is why we look back at the first coming of Christ and we sing and we shout and we rejoice with all of our hearts to the God of our salvation because there is no punishment for us. We will never again fear harm. And, and, and now again, we're in that space between, of course. We're in the already, but not yet. We're living in this scary Genesis 3 world, but we know the end of the story. We look forward to the second coming of Christ where all of this will be consummated, where all of this will come together, where perfection will come into being again. We rejoice because our punishment has been removed. And then I love verse 17. It says, our God, a mighty warrior, right? 
a mighty warrior God. How often do you think of God as a mighty warrior, as your protector? Who did Jesus actually defeat? Sin, death. You want to go to battle today with sin and death? What tools are you going to bring? Good luck with that. I'm bringing Jesus. That's all I got. Our God is this warrior God. God killed death. Incredible. Our God is a warrior. And our God takes great delight in us, according to this text. Verse 18 says there's going to be no more mourning. Verse 19, no more oppression. And then verse 20 says we're all going to be brought home. Man, I love that verse 20. That's the inexhaustible well of the grace of God. God has more grace than we have capacity to sin. And it's not even close. I don't care how you failed. I don't care how you've broken. I don't care how you've messed up your life. I don't care where you've gone wrong, where you've gotten off the rails. God is greater. And God is there in that mess. Whether you need to hear that message today or you need to share that message with somebody in your life today, somebody needs to hear it. God is greater and he is there in your mess. And for all of eternity, he delights in us. For all of eternity, God wants us to increase and to grow in our joy. That is what this Christmas season is all about. Looking back with joy on the Christ who came. Looking at where we are now. Singing and shouting and rejoicing, knowing where we are going. Our punishment removed. Fear losing all power over us. This is all true. So says the word of God. Oppression is losing its power. The lame are being rescued. Disease is losing its power. And we can sit confidently in that because it's the promise of God. Rejoicing while we look forward to that which is to come. This is why the book of John ends, or the, the, the book of Revelation that John writes ends with, Come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Rejoice. And that's what I'd like us to end with today. Rather than some fancy sermon ending, I want to end with us rejoicing. I want to end with us maybe tapping a toe, Scandinavian wiggle, singing together. So I'm going to pray and the worship team is going to come forward and we're going to sing. We're going to make a joyful noise. If you can't sing well, sing loud. But let us do it together. Let us pray.